Hey guys, it's Coach Brian Nugent, and we're back again. And I'm telling you, folks, we got a good one. Hey, you better be sitting down right now, and you better get that notepad and pen out and taking notes because what we're about to drop on you today on coffee or tea with Coach B, we got Dr. Heather Logan joining us today. How you doing, Heather? Awesome. I'm doing really well. Thanks. She's doing fantastic. Yeah. Now, if, if you're wondering, like, man, she looks familiar. I know her. Like, of course you know her, <laughs> right? She's a dual sport athlete, okay, at the highest level in hockey and in cycling. Like, are you kidding me, folks? Yeah, th that's right. You heard correct, okay? Yeah, I only play pro football. She did both. She did hockey and cycling at a very high level, and she's a doctor. So, pff, I'm telling you, she's blowing us out of the water already. So, She's a professor at the University of Toronto, and she also works at the Canadian Sport Institute of Ontario. Did I get that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you oh. got it right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And she's going to share with us, essentially, how she got there, how she made it happen. How was she able to achieve such success of doing two sports at an extremely high level, achieve a doctorate, right? Work at these very... Um, high professional institutes and essentially working with Olympic athletes guys in regards to helping them increase their performance right that's gonna be really cool all right don't forget okay make sure you get your copy don't live another day without me okay it's mm -hmm. in stores it's in Amazon you get it at chapters anywhere around the world you want to change your life you want to get it done don't live another day without me the only self-improvement book you'll ever need but you know what it ain't about this it's about Heather so Heather Thanks for joining. <laughs> Heather, what are you drinking? I'm drinking coffee. Yeah, what yeah. type of coffee? Black coffee. <laughs> I like it strong. <laughs> okay. What I got, Coach, Coach has got uh, citrus lime. Oh, nice. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so thanks for having, uh, thanks for being oh, here. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. Yeah, this is really good. So, so Heather, thanks for joining us. Should I call you Dr. Heather or Dr. Logan? <laughs> what do you go by? Heather. Just call okay. me Heather. <laughs> <Just call me. laughs> okay. So, Heather, I mean, obviously you've done some amazing things, right? Uh, you know, I'm looking at, we're looking at your bio. Very few people in the world have played pro sports. You know, I've been one of the lucky ones that played pro sports. You've done it on, you know, it seems like on two different sports modalities, which is absolutely insanity right very few people could do that and then on top of that you know the icing on the cake then you go out and, and get your doctorate which is just mind-blowing it's absolutely phenomenal and now you're working with olympic athletes but before we get into all of that and you're a mother of two why don't you tell us what it was like growing up being you sure yeah i grew up in a very small town in northwestern ontario called Thessalon on Lake Huron. I basically was the kid who wanted to spend all my time outside. Uh, I just loved playing. And unfortunately at the time, I was very remote. And so we didn't have access to many um, organized sports. So it, we didn't have that buffet of sport options like many kids in the GTA have today. It was baseball in the summer. And you had the choice of hockey, figure skating, and recreational cross-country skiing in the winter, which I kind of dabbled in it all. And uh, my dad was an athlete. Uh, he was, he got a scholarship for and played Canadian University football. Okay. And so, and he had records at his high school for track and field. So he was kind of, he was my playmate, really. Yeah. And uh, you got good yeah. You got some good genes. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. So I was the type of kid who was ready at 4 p.m. dressed in my hockey equipment, waiting for my dad to come home for a 6 p.m. practice start. Like, I just didn't want to leave the ice. I just wanted to play all the time. And I always dreamed of going to the Olympics in any sport, really, because I loved everything. But my longest training age, formal training age, was in hockey because that's what was available to me as a kid. But it didn't come easy. Like, there was no room for complacency when it came to hockey because I played in a boys system. I played boys triple A hockey and wow. my dad was my biggest fan. He was the one who advocated for me. Uh, talked what to coaches age, got me tryouts. What but, age were you doing boys triple A hockey? Uh, I started in boy, like there was no girls hockey. There, oh, so there was system. no girls. So you, you played no. boys hockey. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I found as a girl going into a boy's sport, there was no room for complacency. Like I had to be on all the time because I was proving myself in every practice, every game that I belonged there. And uh, you're really under the gun. So I put a lot of pressure on myself to perform. My parent, my dad put a lot of pressure on me, but yet he was my biggest fan and got, to, got me really where I am because of the work wow. ethic and that there's no room for complacency. You yeah. had to oh. work hard every practice. Okay, so <laughs> this, this is very fascinating and I, and I love this. So, so tell me about how you started to develop the mindset of saying, okay, you know what, there is no complacency. You know what, I can't be in my comfort zone and I gotta get this shit done. Like, how are you mm-hmm. able to even get in that zone? Because let's be honest, there's a lot of people in that circumstance in their life in general oh my Mm -hmm. God, this is scary, this is dangerous. But you, something happened, something shifted, maybe the environment of your dad, like what would you look back to and say, you know what, it was this particular thing that kept me focused to say, I can do this. And maybe there are moments when you didn't believe you could, but you kept going. Mm -hmm. I think my mantra for my entire life has been adapt or die. And it really, now it comes from the physiology of the cell. Like the cell constantly has to adapt to the stress placed on it and get stronger. And if it doesn't adapt, if we didn't adapt on our first breath, we would have died. You know, so it's it's the same. You can either, the cell becomes more, battle it. So as a young child, I had to develop that. Like either I worked my butt off in practice and yeah. off the ice to be at that level, or my career was done. I would be a female in a boys' sport who wasn't making it, right? So I wouldn't be given those opportunities. So I think uh, looking back, I don't know if I knew it at the time, but it really was, I had to adapt to the situation and, or I was done. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. And at first, I don't know if I really understood it. My, my dad understood it. And that's why he put a lot of pressure. Okay. Looks like the internet connection is a little bit unstable. So we're going to move inside. And this, this is very good stuff here, folks. I hope you're taking notes here. Okay. Because... You know, Dr. Heather said, adapt or die. And that might be the title of her, of her next book, <laughs> right? You're either going to adapt or die. We're going to have uh, Jimi Hendrix joining us uh, in the back. <laughs> right there. I love it. All right. We don't want to lose this good stuff here. Okay. So how is this now played in your adult life in regards to being forced to or believing that you have to adapt, die? kind of mindset well I think it it translates into every facet of my life into motherhood as being a wife as being a researcher as being a practitioner as being you know retired athlete but still training I think it's really about I don't want like we are exposed to stress all the time we're exposed Mm -hmm. to hardships life is about that it's inherent to life there's evil in this world that essentially I do have my alarm reaction but I try to activate my toolkit, just like the cell recruits its army within the cell to combat the stress. So I try to do that, my support network, I adapt by trying to get stronger. I expand my toolkit so that the next time I have a stress, I have those tools that I can draw upon. So I think otherwise you're going to get in that state of decompression and, you know, and volatility where the cell can't adapt and that's where the cell dies and the organism is affected and has a disease. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, 99% of the time our cells can't adapt. And it's kind of like us that we could get into a state of anger, bitterness, resentment, hate, self hate when we're exposed to those stressors that really affect us. Or we say, you know, we have the alarm reaction. I'm going to activate my toolkit and my support network and get stronger from this and realize that I have to adapt or I'm going to be in that volatile state. That's fantastic. So give give me an example now, Heather, of a time in your youth where you had that principle, 
or even even your adult life where you had to apply that and say, wow, you know what? I'm so glad that I have this mindset because if I never had this adapt or die mindset, I would really be screwed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I remember specifically like injuries, for example, when I was 16, mm -hmm. but prior to being 16, I had uh, shoulder surgery because I dislocated my shoulder. Oh, I don't know, a handful of times, 12, 15 times. And every time I would dislocate, I would stay out of place. So I had to go to the hospital and get it reduced. And, you know, I was out on the sidelines for four weeks for the most part. Mm -hmm. And so that was hard, especially for an athlete that every minute counts. Like uh, that was, I lived and breathed sports, but my parents also developed in me faith. And that was a big framework of my upbringing that's, uh, developing character, character development, which I try to instill in my kids. And so I had a toolkit, which is really mostly based on biblical principles mm -hmm. about certain verses in the Bible, Proverbs that help me get through, that I can do all things, that, you know, things work out for the good of those who trust in God and his plan and stuff. So I feel like as a young child, mm -hmm. yeah, you do have those stressors, which are catastrophic because that's that's at the time that's your world yeah and so uh, yeah specifically at 16 I remember having shoulder surgery and I was out for you know at least three months and so I had to use those tools those those pieces to help get over the volatility the negative and just stay positive and do what I could do which was riding a bike with my arm in a sling you know staying active working on my character development and my psychology so I could be more resi uh, resilient to stress when I was back in the playing field. Wow. Okay. Fantastic. So it seems like Heather, you growing up and even the Heather of today, right? You're constantly working on self-development and making sure that you have the tools and the strategies that when life throws things at you, you have the mechanisms, whether it's a spiritual mechanism whether it's a mm -hmm. physiological mechanism, an intellectual mechanism to say, okay, you know what? I have the capacity and the ability to deal with this. Is that correct? Yeah, definitely. Like when it comes to working with Olympic athletes, when you're at that level, mm. when you're on the start line at the Olympics, like and you with football, like everyone has worked hard. Everyone has put in hours of training. Yeah. It's the ones Thousands. that have training. Thousands. Oh yeah, it's here. That, thousands, yeah, yeah, thousands of hours of training, and the physiology is not that much different between them, mm. right? But what's the difference is here and controlling the mind, and so I found that, and I was fortunate enough to have parents that really instilled that in me, and realized that a complete athlete is one that focuses on your whether it's your faith, your ability to control stress, your ability to overcome it from the brain. And work hard, work your butt off physically so you're at that level. Okay, so let's talk about the first part, what you said, because I think a lot of people understand the fundamentals of working hard, give it your best, train. I think that's mm -hmm. pretty rudimentary where people understand that. Tell me how your parents went about teaching you the other aspects of the psychology or the spirituality of, hey, this is what you need also in order to be, you know, a holistic athlete, we'll say like fully complete. What, mm -hmm. what would they be doing on a regular basis? Was it like daily prayer you guys would do? Would it be like, you know, you and your dad would sit down and talk about, you know, the psychology of sports? How would that be go about in your household? I think it was more my mom who always gave me perspective. She was not an athlete. And so she's like, life is more than sports, Heather. Like you have to think. Uh, I, she was the one who I took piano lessons. I did music. I did art. I had sisters who did art. So I was constantly exposed to other things and hockey or the sport was just an activity I did. Mm -hmm. So the focus was on many others developing me as a person and realizing that sport. Yeah, it's fun now, but it has a finite lifespan. Like mm -hmm. you will not be able to compete for your entire life at, at a high, high level, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's where even as a child I knew that I wanted to pursue Hey Heather, career. I just dunked at 42, so I'm not quite sure what you're talking about, but I'm listening. I, I saw you. that. That was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no. and I just posted a video of Vince Carter dunking at 42, which is like the world's greatest dunker, just so people understand the context of what just happened. 
but go uh, on. Yeah, yeah, I understand. <laughs> 42 is still young. <laughs> I still try to do everything I used yeah. to do. No, oh, so, and then, uh, yeah, biblically, a, a verse that was a staple for me as a child is train yourself in godliness for physical training is of some value, but spiritual training has value for this life and the life to come. And so I really tried, okay, I spend all this time physically training, but how am I training my mind and my soul? And so I, at a young age, just said, okay, I put three hours in, four hours of training in a day. I'm also going to do at least an hour of my own character development. Wow. And so that, that was really because I br was brought up with that faith. It was much around that. But I started reading books and different things on uh, how to be a charismatic person and how to influence people and how to control my own emotions. And so that was a huge part. And I'm very thankful for my parents for, you know, saying, telling me, Hey, sports isn't everything. You need to become a good person. You need to work on your character. So, yeah. Wow. That's fantastic. Wow. All right, folks, I hope you're really listening out here, especially for our young viewers that are watching this and understanding the full parameters of you know another way of just getting to the top is not just about sport but also developing your character okay it's fantastic so heather you obviously you did hockey you did it at a very high level if, if i'm not mistaken you were the captain of the canadian national junior team for canada mm -hmm. is that correct mm -hmm. okay. yeah that's correct yeah. you're right uh she has a killer slap shot by the way uh just lightning uh and sean <laughs> Sean, if you're watching this, you know who you are. It's her slap shot is harder than yours and faster. But um, in any event, you transition into bicycling, cycling. How did that happen? How did you go from being a top level hockey player to finding cycling and, and then achieving it at a very high level? How did that happen? Yeah, sure. Uh, so as inherent to sport, there's lots of ups and downs. And for me, there was probably more downs than ups, funny enough. And I think that's pretty realistic for most people. Uh, so I was in the bubble of the uh, athletes who were being released from the national team program. And it was just a turnover and I was caught in the middle of it. So in 2008 was basically, it was goodbye to hockey. And well, not hockey, like hockey. I still was playing in the National Women's Hockey League, but with the national team program. And mm -hmm. it was devastating for me. It was devastating. I was happy to have a toolkit that I could drop on. And so I always cycled and competed in triathlons in the off season just to keep in shape because I believed in, I was a multi-sport athlete. I grew up that way. I wasn't, which was to my benefit, but also to my demise when it came to selection because I wasn't fully focused on one sport. And so uh, anyways, a friend of mine asked if I wanted to go to national road cycling nationals that year. And it was an Olympic, it was a summer Olympics year. And I said, are you kidding me? Me going to nationals. So I went with her just for kicks and I placed fourth that year. And I beat some of the girls who were going to the Olympics that summer. And so the national team coach came to her. me. Yeah. And the national team, and it was just such a fluke. And the national team coach came to me and said, Hey, like, I like what you're doing on the bike. You want to come and do a six day stage race, stage race in Germany. And so I said, me, like, are you serious? Like I have a steel bike and I'm a hockey player on a bike. <laughs> okay, sure. Why not? And so, you know, we're going to get you I, the, I, don't worry. We're going to get you the $25,000 bike. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Well, yeah. I have something close to that, but yeah. <laughs> anyways, coming from hockey, like I was all about teamwork and I was satisfied with playing a role and being happy with it. And so with cycling, it's such a team sport as well. Not many people know that dynamic. No, a lot of people but, don't see it like that. Yeah, so there's, there's, you have a role. And I was going as a domestique, which in cycling means the servant. So I basically was the guinea pig, uh, you know, hammer as hard as I could at the front to spread out the peloton and set my teammates up for their big win. Meanwhile, I might not even finish the race. Yeah. So I went to Germany and uh, I almost died, but I was a great teammate and, uh, and my team did well. And it took me about a month to recover. And at the time I was, really? I started my master's. 
Oh yeah, because it was such a shock to the system. Like so tell us of- for our viewers that are watching that are unfamiliar with what you would experience, how many kilometers uh, would you have ridden in how many days and what was the rest time? Just to kind of give us some right. context. Sure, so each stage was about 120 kilometers. But it's not about the distance, it's about the intensity. You could probably ride that on your own and take Mm -hmm. your time going up the hills. It's when you have to hammer uphill that someone else's intensity, it's hard. And uh, in hockey, you can get away with a little bit of not being as fit. But in cycling, there's no hiding. If you're not dialed in with your training to race specific preparation, you're going to suffer. So you did 120K. Per day? Yeah, but that yeah, that was every day for six days. Every day for six days, and what? How, and how long did you do that in? I don't know, three hours. Three hours. Okay, just so our viewers know, because I mean, a lot of people yeah. they hear the intensity, but they're not sure. Like, what exactly does that mean? Okay, cool. Yeah, so 120k in three hours, so average wow. 40k an hour, but it wow. depends on how many climbs there are, etc. And so in Germany, obviously, the the hills are huge, so it was really hard. It was hard because I've never done that before. So then I came back to the lab and got a phone call out of the blue and it was a director of a women's cycling team asking me if I'd want to sign a contract with them for the next year. And funny enough, it was one of the best women's pro cycling teams in the world called Team Cola Vida at the time. And so I said, me? Like, really me? <laughs> and so I still played hockey that season, but uh, in the National Women's Hockey League, but I switched my focus to more cycling. Cycling became the sport that I was really training for. Okay. So that, that next year, I went to did all the European classics. I competed in the Giro d'Italia, which in the Route de France, which is a, a girls' version of the Tour de France, and I competed in World Championships for Canada that next season. So yeah. So how long were you cycling beforehand? Like we'll call it, you know, hardcore training. Even if you were hardcore training or not, because obviously you know, you're already a high performance athlete, right? So like when Mm -hmm. I retired from football, I got a call from the Canadian bobsledding team. So I knew the transition would not be like, oh, I got to go train hard because I was already like a very high level. So I'm curious or we're curious, was there a lot of hardcore cycling going on before you had your first call where you you finished fourth or was it you're already in tip top shape and then your physical modalities kind of transferred over well? Uh, I would say that I always loved my bike from a a small child. So I always rode. And with my hockey training, so many people, when it comes to strength and conditioning, are strength focused. But I was more on the conditioning focus side because I felt like it translated better to on ice performance. So I did a lot of anaerobic threshold rides. I was doing lots of high intensity interval training, sit, sprint interval training in my own hockey training. And it was all on the bike. So I wasn't putting in huge amount of volume, but I was putting in intensity. So that's where the volume really got me when it came to stage racing, because I didn't have three hours of cycling in every single day. Mm -hmm. So by day three, I was like, oh my goodness, this is so hard. And I just had to activate that toolkit to get me through. So, uh, yeah, so I did do training. I did, I focused on conditioning for hockey. Not as much strength, but uh, yeah. So I did possibly maybe six hours of cycling per week while I was a hockey player. Okay. That might be a little bit too much, maybe four to six hours, Okay. but mostly at a higher intensity. And now that you look back in hindsight, would you have gone as far as you would have in hockey or would you have chosen a different, uh, chosen a different career now that you know what you know now, or would you still continue on with the same path? Uh, That's a great question. Hockey was good for me. Like I did because of being carded with the the national team program, I did get my whole education paid for, which was fantastic. And hockey, I love the variety of skills that you need inherent to the sport. So that was fun. Uh, I think I would have started in cycling earlier because as a female, it was actually a professional. So I was playing in the National Women's Hockey League, which is equivalent to the NHL for females. Mm -hmm. However, you don't make a salary. Mm -hmm. You don't, you might get a few sticks free in a year. You, you, You bust to places, like you don't get meals paid for. You don't get really anything paid for. Mm. So, 
And, but if you're carded with the national team program, then you do make a stipend each month and you potentially could get some sponsorship, but you get the hand-me-downs from the men's team. At the time we got hand-me-downs and they're all like, but when I moved to cycling, they're like, here's a contract that you actually get paid a good salary in US dollars. You got everything free. Like you got, like, it was actually what considered professional. So it was really, it was really cool. Uh, and in, in Europe, the culture of cycling is massive. It is unbelievable. And so you would get tons of fans coming and asking for your autograph. And, and so for, as a female in sport, it actually was a sport that was truly professional. And I don't think many people know that. In Canada, we don't have a culture of cycling yeah. as n nothing compared to even the U.S. But Europe is just, they live and breathe cycling. They're bred for cycling, especially the Dutch. Mm -hmm. So amazing that's fantastic okay so that's really good background really gave us a good scope of things lead us into how you now you know decided or you know go to that next level of now achieving the highest academic level <laughs> right you know you did it in sport now you're like well i might as well just do it in academia when did you make up your mind where you're like you know what i'm, I'm going to get a doctorate and we'll say um, exercise physiology or sports science? Mm, yeah, I, I always knew I wanted to do something in science or medicine. And what deterred me from being a medical doctor was the fact that it's more reactive uh, prescription, that you're reacting to someone's sickness, et cetera. And I was more from a, from a sport background, I wanted to be proactive. I wanted to develop solutions to be proactive. And that's where I always thought research was more for me because you're helping uh, mitigate knowledge gaps. By creating knowledge, you can translate that to hopefully, hopefully prevent uh, things from happening or help in performance before we're being reactive. So I always had an idea of research. Uh, and it wasn't until my fourth year at University of Toronto where I had uh, a professor in biochemistry and exercise phys that uh, was a really strong female role model. And I was like, I want to be like her. And so that's where I decided to pursue research. Wow. And pursue so graduate school. How old were you when you were making up your mind that this is the path? Was it like grade eight, grade nine, end of high school, first year of university? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I got a, in high school, I got a uh, scholarship to a private girl school in Toronto for sports, really, and somewhat academics. So I went there and it was there that I had some teachers that really uh, cultivated a love for science and made physiology real. And a few of them really helped me understand the parallels between how our body functions inside and how we can live our life like homeostasis, all these different things that, mm -hmm. and so I really developed like a good picture in my mind of, uh, of physiology and a love for it. Uh, so that was, so I learned how to learn at that school and it made me really um, want to pursue science. And, you know, it, as an athlete, as a female athlete in various sports, like you, it, it's not, it doesn't pay the bills. <laughs> and it won't pay the bills. So in reality, you have to have some other career besides. So I always knew that hockey, unfortunately, it's not at a state where you can actually do it and get paid to do it. Mm -hmm. So I always had, was under the mindset, I have to go to university, I have to go on. And yeah, so that to me was always, it was a no brainer. I was going to university and getting a degree. Mm -hmm. Okay, did school come easy for you? Uh, in, no, no, I work. If it did, off. if it comes easy, if <laughs> no. it's okay to say it's easy. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Like, I wasn't the kid that wanted to read books. I wasn't the reader. I, like, wanted to help. I was the Okay, let me, let me rephrase the question. When you're given something, do you find it challenging to absorb the information and to learn it and then to recite it? whether it's through an exam or a test or a presentation or do you are you like oh shit you know like this this is really <laughs> like how do i manage like you know what i mean it'd be no like different yeah. than a sport right like some people are like yeah. i'm just not coordinated i can't do yeah. it my body you know what i mean we know those people you're a high performance yeah. athlete i know them personally and mm -hmm. then they're really good in something else so for you academically 
right? We're curious, you know, whether it's, was it, if it was something that came easy, I'm totally fine with that. You know, or you're mm -hmm. like, you know what? I actually had a, oh man, like, you know, to get that doctor and like to get out of UFT, like, oh, geez, you know, it was long hours. Like, we don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So once I found something I wanted to learn, once I found physiology, like high school, I found it was, I don't know, I was, I was, I was an A student. Yeah. I did well. Once I learned how to learn. And that was really once I went to that private school uh, and had some good teachers. So I found teachers really helped me. Uh, but once I went to university and started doing courses I wanted to do and enjoyed, I did well at them. I found it was easy. It was easy to read. It was easy to do that. My doctorate was not easy. It's not easy. Research is not easy. Uh, it's very self-directed. And I was used to that from sports. I think a lot of the things I learned in sports helped me, obviously with time management and uh, work ethic, et cetera, to do it and do it well. Uh, but yeah, but certainly like, yeah, school was, I like, I like to learn. Yeah. yeah. You like to learn. So you, you said something, which is, you know, kind of piqued my interest. You learned how to learn, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's learning on, you know, so many different levels. Some people are visual learners. Some people are auditory learners. Some people are kinetic mm -hmm. learners. You learn how to learn. Uh, tell our viewers exactly what that actually means and, and what actually happened when you learned how to learn. Yeah, I think for me, it was finding out exactly what you said, what, mo what modality was the best for me to learn. And so I think also for me, I'm a picture person. So I had to be able in high school, take something and either see it from the science, like for physiology, I have a picture in my head of how the cell works. And I relate that to you know, a factory and factory workers moving things around and conveyor belts and stuff. So like I had to, for me to learn how to learn, I had to tie those two things together, tie something from um, a cellular concept to big picture reality and make it applied. And then I got it. And then it was never leaving my brain. So it's one thing to merely memorize things. It's another thing to know things. And so I would, I guess I learned how to learn by learning how to know and learning, finding those ways that I actually knew it and it wasn't going to leave my brain instead of just merely memorizing things, which can be gone the next day. And is that what your teachers taught you? I think, I think they, uh, a couple of teachers and a biology teacher may make connections to big world from a cell or whatever it may be, or math, making math real or something to that effect. And so that just triggered, okay, I can do this on my own. And then I figured out, okay, this is the way I learn the best. If I can do this, I'm going to. Got you. So then it reduced, then I actually could, I knew it, you know, so it wasn't like it was leaving my brain. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Let's talk a little bit. I just want to rewind a little bit. So you leave hockey and then you were kind of pushed out a little bit according to you. And you say you were absolutely devastated. How long was that time of devastation and, and what happened in that time period and how did you get out of it? Because I mean, obviously a lot of people, they have setbacks, they have challenges. A lot of people get in these forms of, you know, crises and they've never really bounced back. Mm -hmm. They've never actually come back you were able mm -hmm. to deal with something that was your love. You loved hockey. You, you did it your whole entire life. And then to mm -hmm. have it come crashing down, but then you still were able to respond and get out of it on the other side. And when others would be watching this and saying, man, I was in the same situation just like that. And I'm still, I'm 55 and I still can't get out. And that happened to me at 19. Mm -hmm. Right. How were you yeah. able to get out of that? Because you did use the word devastated. And yeah. how long were you devastated I, for and what did you do to get out of it? Yeah, that's, it was, it was devastating because I always thought I was doing everything right to make the Olympic team. And I thought like I dreamed of the Olympics, not just world championships for hockey, for women, it's the Olympics. That's what it is. It's that one game. Yeah. Right. So it, it was devastating because it was the fact that, the coaching staff never told me that I wasn't good enough. 
you know, it'd be different. They're like, you have everything we want. You're a leader. You can score goals. You can do this. You can do this. You have a great work ethic. You're the fittest off the ice. All this stuff. But I'm like, just tell me what it is. If they told me I wasn't, you know, aggressive enough or something, if there was something that they could tell me, then I would have been okay with it. I wasn't good enough. And I would have been fine with that because I knew I put in my full self. Mm -hmm. But because of that, I wasn't satisfied with their response. And I think that's why it was devastating because I'm like, I've done everything. Why? And so I really, I really had to tap into my toolkit and my support system and realize that you know many are the plans in a man's heart but it's God's plan that prevails and that was a proverb that stuck with me that I had this plan I thought I was going to make it I was doing everything checking off the list but ultimately it was out of my control and uh, when I look back it was for the best because the path led me to better things right but how did I get out of that it was really how did you get out of it and then how long were you in it yeah, it, I was in it for about probably at least a couple months where yeah. I was quite, quite angry, mm-hmm. angry at the system. Yeah. Uh, but then I realized that either I'm going to play the victim and be upset about it, or I'm going to choose something else. And I'm still playing in the National Women's Hockey League. So I'm like, I'm going to prove them wrong. So it actually created a fire in me, kind of like an angry fire to, mm-hmm. so that season, I think, I was one of the top leading scorers in the league. I just made it, put it in their face that you made a bad decision and make it obvious that it was a bad decision. So it more motivated me as well. I kind of, it, it was a blessing in the fact that I said, you know what? I focus so much on just this sport, but I love so many sports. I'm going to try something different. And that's why I said yes to going to nationals for cycling. Otherwise I wouldn't have that summer. So It took me about a couple months and then I had to let it go because it was robbing me of my happiness and robbing me of, you know, um, it was, there's bitterness, there's anger and that's toxic and volatile. Mm. And so I just had to say, you know, it was out of my control. I tried my best and I can't let this affect me. I do not want to waste any more time feeling like this and being this not good cycle. So that's where I shifted. And I actually started in track cycling and I would compete. I went to nationals for track cycling and did well there. And that's, and, and went to road cycling, uh, road racing and went to national championships and did well that summer. And then kind of just went into it from there and realized that, you know, what I, I, I'm, that's not going to stop me from my love of sport. But, yeah. That's fantastic. Okay. So let's move into your doctorate now. So, you know, you're a doctor uh, in sports physiology. Yeah. Right? Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, tell us about your thesis. Tell us about what exactly you're doing and the impact that you're having in, we'll call it the sporting world. Sure. So uh, my thesis was I did my graduate work at University of Guelph. Under my supervisor was Dr. Lawrence Spreet. He's known as the Gatorade Sports Science Man of Canada. So he works with Gatorade. So when I applied to him, I had an interview, he accepted me. And so my thesis was really supported by the Gatorade Sports Science Institute. And they provided funding for my PhD as well. So I did things, practical sport testing on NBA, NFL, NHL teams for sweat and hydration, very practical for Gatorade. And then I also married that with more exercise metabolism where I take muscle biopsies of someone exercising and look at how metabolism is changing, how it's impacted by dehydration, nutrition, et cetera. So that was kind of my area was exercise metabolism. Uh, From there, the reason why I was going to do my PhD is I wanted to be the CEO of a national wide Olympic high performance center. I wanted to do that and I wanted to go to the top and that was my passion. Of course. And so, what else would, uh, you know, Dr. Heather want? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, why not? yeah. <laughs> so anyways, uh, so while I was doing that, I also, um, from there, my first job was at the Canadian Sport Institute as their lead of physiology, uh, where I led, managed a group of eight physiologists in different national sport organizations, cycling, triathlon, that worked with Olympic programs. Mm-hmm. And I worked as a practitioner as well as a swimming physiologist uh, for the national swim team. 
And then uh, I also created their research and innovation department. So I, was, I became the director of research and innovation there as well. And it was great. Like I was able to translate my experience in sports. So I knew like the athletes, we got along well because I could relate to them from my experience. And then partnering that with the science behind it, it really, um, I found it, it was effective. So that's, uh, that's where I went with my PhD. I went right to industry. And then I moved back to academia more recently. So as mentioned, I'm an assistant professor at Ontario Tech University, but also I'm an adjunct at University of Toronto. And I still direct the research and innovation at the Canadian Sport Institute to really work with coaches to help, you know, what are your gaps, your performance gaps? conduct need analysis, gap analysis. Okay, can we mitigate some of those either performance or knowledge gaps through research and innovation? And so I create a four, eight year plan for them to help answer those questions to improve the performance of the integrated support team or their athletes. Okay, fantastic. So let me ask you this, because I mean, obviously most of our viewers that are watching this, they're not Olympic athletes. They're not pro athletes. They're not even national athletes. But Mm -hmm. give me like three good tips let's focus on a training aspect right now mm -hmm. what are three common errors that people are making when it comes to their training we'll say for the average person all right let's just use the context of i'm a mother or it could be a dad right i go to the gym three times a week i try to do my best what my best looks like i really don't know but what are three common errors that you see people doing when it comes to their training methodologies? Yeah, I think the first one, based right. on the, the clientele you just mentioned, is really uh, making unrealistic expectations of yourself that are unachievable. Okay. So making a program for yourself that's kind of pie in the sky based on your own current life uh, stage and expecting you to deliver that for six weeks, eight weeks, eight months, making it a part of your life. And so people don't set them up for success. People don't set themselves up for success. They expect fitness will come like this and they need to be working out four or five times a week, or even, but there's not, it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. So I always, whenever I work with someone, I always say, okay, what's sustainable for you? We want to make this sustainable. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. pick, you know, let's, let's make it work within your, schedule. So that's the number one. Uh, number two is exercise alone doesn't work. It's nutrition as well. So you got to dial in if you're only in the gym or working out three times a week. Well, all the other time you're eating. So obviously nutrition <laughs> is a huge like component. Yeah. I like, and it's, I like how you frame that. You know, hey, you're working out three days a week, but all the other times you're eating. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, really. <laughs> like, so, and anecdotally, it suggested that 80% of the changes is nutritional. Like, you're good at working out, but if you're not dialing in what you're eating, then there's going to be a disconnect and you're not going to see the positive change that you want. So that's the second piece is, okay, let's take a look at your nutrition. Mm -hmm. uh, the third one is making sure that you're getting enough of a cellular stimulus, mm. either too much or too little. Right. So we got to we got to dial in looking at your training prescription. So obviously your cells adapt to stress. You do need a stress. Mm -hmm. And so but you don't need a, it when it comes down to athletes. Sometimes we have too much stress and we have this overall monotony of training where it's medium intensity all the time. And you're not, you're doing lots of volume, but you're not getting to the polars. You're not resting, which rest is good. And you're not getting to that high, high level to cause the cellular change to adapt. So you're really just draining yourself, right? So I think looking at the prescription. So if you are only working out three times a week, what are we doing during those three times? To yeah, so are you recommending your... that people do high intensity, shorter volume, um, you know, less time in the gym, higher intensity? Just so like for more layman terms, so they understand. Yeah. So for, if you're starting out, obviously you want to start out slow. So sure. the first couple of weeks, you don't want to do CrossFit. You don't want to do anything high intensity because that might lead to Unless injury. you have a good CrossFit coach. That's right. That's right. 
<laughs> go to Brian for sure. Uh, but yeah, you want to maximize the time that you're exercising. So I'm a huge believer in sit, fit, uh, hit, whatever it may be to cause that, that stimulus to change. Uh, yeah, definitely. But you have to do it progressively. So you're not going to hurt yourself yeah. and you're going to be making it sustainable for yourself. Got it. So as long as the athlete can protect themselves from not getting injured, right? Mm -hmm. The focus should be once you've taken care of that, making sure it's like orthopedically sound, high intensity, shorter work period. Is that essentially yeah. what you're saying? Yeah, I think, yes. In general, I like mean, generally, generally. general here, because, you know, we yeah. have to look at the athlete, we have to say, okay, what is the best training prescription for mm -hmm. you? But, you know, once again, we have, you know, quite a few people watching this and they're all coming from different places. Okay, cool. That's, that's really good advice. So what are three common mistakes you see people now making with their eating? Yeah, that's first off. Uh, like what, what kind of plan? Three is not the number, you know, it could be five. It could be one. You know, I just, three just sounded good. <laughs> eating too much sugar. Number one, the timing of nutrient intake. Okay. And so too much sugar. Let's, let's talk about that one because you have a lot of people saying, I love my sugar. It's, it's so yummy. It's so delicious. Like what about <laughs> glucose? Like I heard sugar is glucose. I need it. Like, you know what I mean? Like we, we got to make sure that like they understand fully what you're saying. Go ahead. Yeah. So sugar, I mean, simple sugars, simple sugars during exercise that's longer than 60 to 90 minutes is good because it's metabolized right away. It spares your glycogen. It's giving you immediate energy. Got you. Sugar outside of that causes the insulin response, spikes your blood glucose, spikes your insulin, develops insulin resistance, which is the basis of a lot of metabolic syndrome and disease eventually. It's not good. It's just not good. It's not good for your body. Your body doesn't like anything that's putting blood glucose so what about wine? high I mean, ranges. I, lo I love my wine. That's what people are going to say. What would you say? Okay. Uh, I would say, suggest that, you know, it's all in moderation. Uh, extra dry, very dry, extra dry is better because it has less grams per liter. Uh, I don't know that. Yeah. So you can reduce it from 30 grams per liter down to two or three grams per liter of sugar oh. by going very dry. So folks, I hope you're yeah. writing this down. This is some good notes. Yeah. Go on. So that's, that's one. And it's just training your your palate to not want sugar. Obviously sugar is addictive Yes. and you will be addicted, but it's very important that you go off it just for your own health. And how does one train their palate to get off of sugar? Is there any type of vitamins, minerals? Is it just sheer willpower? Is it, Hey, incorporate these types of foods in your life and it will start to reduce. I get it. What would mm -hmm. you say to them if they're like, Heather, Dr. Heather, I'm addicted to sugar. And I have no idea how you expect me not to eat this chocolate bar. How would you number say one, in willpower? Yeah. Uh, number one is don't buy it. Don't have it in the house. Don't buy it. Okay. That is the first step to helping with willpower. Keep it simple. If I don't have a chocolate bar in the house, I'm not going to eat it. If yeah, I don't I'm have junk food in the house. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. Instead, yeah. it could be your treat every once in a while. Yeah. Like I really believe in that 80, 20 rule, 80% of the time you're eating healthy, nutritious foods. That's helping build your body back up. Well, 20% of the time you can have the, the choices that you want to, you know, have some satiety and pleasure in life, et cetera, but from food, but uh, yeah, just don't buy it. Number one, number two, there's so much evidence to suggest that sugar causes metabolic syndrome and it leads to a decrease of your health span. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, you have kids running around, you want to be there for them, for your own health. It's just not good. You just, you just really need to stop or minimize the amount that you're eating. It's about minimizing. It's about moderation. It's not about eliminating. Okay. All right. And then what was the number two you would say? Um, so sugar, get rid of sugar. What was the next thing you said? Uh, I would say that the second one is shop on the perimeter of the grocery store where you don't have that processed food. Most of the processed food is in the middle, which is very energy dense. So lots of calories, but not nutrient full. 
And so it doesn't, once your body doesn't have the nutrients, you're not going to get that sense of satiety. It's like the classic example of going to McDonald's and eating, um, you know, Big Mac meal. And an hour later, you're like, I'm kind of hungry. Like, but yeah. you just consumed 1500 calories because they're more empty calories. So they're calorically dense, but not nutrient dense. So it's better to pick nutrient dense dense options because your body it, a nutrient is really provides nutritional value to the organism and it helps you to rebuild your own broken down cells your broken down nucleic acids like your dna so you gotta feed that otherwise your body will feel hungry until it gets those nutrients to rebuild its own system and so yeah focus on nutrient dense food options not energy dense food options so again, this is the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the time have nutrient dense solutions to your nutrition. 20% mm -hmm. of the time, you know, you can enjoy the pleasures of whatever, some treats, et cetera. What would you say to the individuals, right? Cause I mean, I've been dealing with this, you know, 25 years working with people with what you're talking about. What would you say to the individuals that are like, okay, Dr. Heather, I hear what you're saying. Uh, but I noticed that when I do that 20%, all hell broke loose. <laughs> well, obviously those yeah. people exist i mean i would say that's easily 30 to 40 percent of people where they're like hey i get it mm -hmm. i would like to do that but when i do that all hell breaks loose what would how would you manage those people yeah i would for those people either and i know it, it is hard but it's self-discipline it really is a lot of self-discipline. Okay. Um, How does someone get self-discipline if they don't have self-discipline? We obviously, earlier on in your interview, you're like, yeah. you know, I have spiritual tools, I have psychological tools, I had my dad, you know, I adapt or die. Like, you, you got a yeah. good toolbox, and everybody's got a different toolbox. Like, you know, my yeah. toolbox, you know, personally is like, I just tell myself, get your shit together. Like, don't fuck around. Mm -hmm. Like, that just works for me. Mm -hmm. As soon as I tell myself that, like, <laughs> it's done. You know what I mean? Yeah. But we're talking to other people who are like, I, I want to do it, but I just don't have the discipline. How would you handle that person? Yeah, I would say, okay, well, number one, don't buy the crap. Yeah, Get someone else to do it. your shopping for you if necessary. Okay. Number two, have accountability, pro uh, a person that holds you accountable. Accountable who? Yeah, okay. Yeah, like, yeah, it could be a family member. It could be a, uh, someone in your home, et cetera. I think it's a conviction finding you have to find deep down people aren't going to change until they're convicted of the change that they need to do. So I, you could tell someone over and over and over again that they need to lose weight, but until they realize that they actually do themselves and have conviction, then they're not going to make the change. So it's getting deeper into, okay, so how does somebody what, are, is this emotional eating, like getting to the root cause of mm -hmm. why they can't have the discipline? Okay. And so then, I think that's important for all of us to do, right? Like even yeah. we and don't know our blind spots. Someone develop conviction. Like I think you're saying all good things and I agree with you 100%, right? But I do know by working with people, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They'll say this to me. They're like, coach B, like I want discipline. I don't have it. I want conviction, but I don't even know what it is. I want to do the right things, but I'm just lost. Like we're dealing with a generation of people that, don't even have the foundation of things that we've taken maybe for granted because we have it. We're like, yeah, you know what? It's time to buckle down. We're going to get this done. And we, we know what that means. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like, but, mm -hmm. but they'll be like, buckle down? Man, I would love to buckle down. What is buckle down? Like, you know what I mean? Because <laughs> their whole life, there was no structure. There was yeah. no, hey, you better get it done. There was no adapt or die. There was mm -hmm. no, these are the consequences. But now as they became an adult, right? Mm -hmm. they've, mm -hmm. Intellectually, they get it. They're like, this makes sense. I know mm -hmm. what you're saying intellectually, but I don't even have one cell of my body that even vibrates or operates that way. Is there anything you would say to those people? Because that's actually a very big par a portion of the population, sadly, but it's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's a tough question. That's that's a loaded question. I don't know. What do you think, Brian? <laughs> well, I did say hey <laughs> it's real and read your book. <laughs>
<laughs> I don't think I really have an answer to that. Yeah. I would say that it's really like self-help. I would direct them to okay. some great books I or something, things That's that I've read. Okay. Seeing read what book. like, yeah, but also just talking to them about their motivation in life. Hmm possibly getting them to think and self-reflect like I'm a huge fan of that like that's been I'm constantly trying to be more aware of my own actions and who I like who I am so like developing questions so not only training them from a physical standpoint but training them from a mental or spiritual standpoint saying okay let's because they may not have had that before people absolutely we can't assume that they had the same so perhaps that might help Okay. I mean, that, that could... No, this is this is very good, right? Because you know, I think a lot of times, you know, we're under the assumption that people have the foundation or some foundation there. You know, mm-hmm. in all my training, a lot of it, you know, is like, oh, you know, guide them, they'll figure it out. Guide them, they'll figure it out. I'll say, you know what? After working with twenty five thousand people for twenty five years, you know what? Thirty percent of them, they're fucking clueless. Do you know what I mean? And, and that's not, I'm not being disrespectful. I'm not being rude to them. They're just like, you know what? I never even had an ounce of what you're even talking about. Mm-hmm. I know nothing of what you're actually saying. I've seen it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I've heard of it. You know what I mean? But I have never experienced it whatsoever. Right? Mm-hmm. You know, I've had obese clients that were 400 pounds and they're like, I grew up with donuts in the morning that were fried in oil and we had that with hot chocolate. That's breakfast to me. And they're 55. Mm -hmm. So if you say to them, Hey, you know what? We got to eat nutrient dense foods. You know, we got to make sure that, you know, (laughs) not about how many calories you have. They're like, you feel what I'm saying? Oh yeah. Okay, cool. All right, no, I think that's where education comes into, right? Because we can't assume that people know what we're talking about. Yeah. Like I worked as a fitness trainer for years when I was in high school and in early university at women's fitness centers. And it was the same thing. And a lot of the time I would just talk to them. It was more of a therapy session where I'm like, okay, let's talk about what motivates you. Why are you here? Like what? And like, then they talk about their kids or they want to be here for their grandkids or whatever it may be. And then that was the start of the conviction Okay. And propelled them to work on their health and just be aware. Okay. All right. I think that that's really good insight right there. That's really good insight. Okay. So you're a mom, you, you got two mm-hmm. beautiful kids. Uh, one of them, uh, I've seen her daughter guys do not look in her eyes. They're very hypnotic, right? She could be, <laughs> she's a total Ambry Crombie model uh, right out of a magazine. What, what is your philosophy as a parent in regards to, you know, besides the obvious, I love my kids. I want them to be, do well, you know, do whatever they want as long as they're happy. We get that, right? Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll assume that's true. But mm-hmm. what are some basic fundamental principles that you have as a parent where you're like, all right, mm-hmm. you know, these are some things that I need to instill in them clearly, right? You growing up, spirituality, that's very specific. You know what I mean? There mm-hmm. are the other households are like, no, we're not doing that. Your house, that's what it was. Very specific. Mm-hmm. Hey, you know what? Mm-hmm. You're involved in sport. That's very specific, right? Mm-hmm. What are some core principles that you are applying as a mother in your household and with your children? Yeah, I think uh, motherhood, first of all, is the most rewarding and hardest experience of my life. But I'm just so blessed to have two healthy children and be called a mom. I think it's the best calling ever. Uh, I really strive to be a mom that motivates, inspires, encourages all that fluffy stuff and gracefully challenges my kids to be the best version of themselves. Obviously, I want to teach them the importance of integrity and respect, authenticity and hard work. But very much of that is rooted in character development and Obviously, at first, when I had my daughter, I wanted her to pursue, be as excited about sport as I was as a child. And I questioned, really? You don't want to be competitive at the age of four? Come on. What's wrong with you? But then I had to take a step back and realize that, you know, first and foremost, I want her to be a good, my kids to be good people. Yeah. And be, because that's lasting, right? That's lasting for the, and obviously I want them to be active and fit and healthy but first and foremost i want them to have good character and develop resilience and those skills that my parents taught me 
when I was a kid that I feel like has carried through beyond sport and into every avenue of my life. So I think that to me is the biggest character development Yeah, and, and exposing you, them to a exper uh, experience. Okay. How do you go about showing them or demonstrating character development? Like I totally understand what you're saying, but what do you do for that? Like, do you wake up and say, okay, this is what they got to do today to help with character development? Is it more of like the demonstration between what you and your husband mm -hmm. do and you're just your normal every day and then you're like, well, they'll just pick up on it. Do you know what I mean? Like what yeah. specifically are you doing for that? Are you getting them to read scripture for character development? Are you getting them to volunteer with underprivileged people? Like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think all of the above, everything you just said. So living out and being a role model for them because there comes a time when your kids, yeah, they need you when they're really little, but that transitions to where they don't need you as much, but you're a solid role model for them. Mm -hmm. So obviously you want a role model. We're not perfect. And I tell my kids all the time, I'm genuine to them. I say sorry regularly. I apologize. I I tell them that mommy has flaws like I, but I am trying to improve. It's being authentic with them. Mm. And I think that's huge to see that we are just people that I'm just a person with flaws, but I try my best every day. And I set these principles before me that I try to uphold, but I'm not perfect. Right. And I think that's, I think that's Very really powerful. important Very powerful. because just being, you know, candid with them about, the struggles in life and um you know teaching them when something goes wrong but also like one thing is biblical teaching like that's fun, like the fruit of the spirit like love joy peace patience all of kindness goodness there's so much that you can take from those things to develop in your kids and focusing on maybe one of them for a week well, let's work on joy well what is joy and how can we live out joy today or how can we bring joy to someone else and doing acts of kindness or whatever it may be but that kind of stuff just making not only just teaching the theory but applying applying those principles mm. and then again like we're under the camera every second of every day especially interactions with my husband and you know we're not perfect and we may have quarrels but it's how we respond and how we end that argument or end that discussion right mm. and so yeah ultimately being graced by love being encouraged and as every all the fluffy stuff that parents are supposed to be but really being authentic and candid with them and just spending time it's quality and quantity time with a child is huge hmm. very good tips very good tips how do you want to be remembered heather <laughs> i think I it's really want, These yeah, are to get every day. I don't, you might get a different answer tomorrow, but I really want to be a person known for um, being authentic, uh, really trying to get the best version of other people out of them, like helping, mm -hmm. uh, being charismatic. Mm -hmm. I think being a person rooted in good faith and uh, being off, really authenticity is huge for me uh yeah i don't know i want to be a good mom obviously yeah we know a little bit. Be a role yeah. model yeah. All the, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> the typical <laughs> oh i don't know i just want to be a, i don't know yeah i'm That's not sure no, 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 no it's fantastic. <laughs> listen i know listen these are not questions every day you get it is coffee or tea with coach b it's raw yeah. real right that's why people tune in um you know what heather this was a fantastic interview i yeah, want to thank you for sharing everything that you've shared uh those that are watching guys there is enormous value all the way from you know what it was like you know with the basic principles of growing up being heather you know being involved in scripture working on her character development not just being involved in sport all the way from being a high performance athlete, dealing with setbacks, how to get out of setbacks when life is challenging, finding a new avenue, finding blessings in the skies, right? Learning how to learn, right? And also, you know, just being charismatic and being authentic and, and being pure. And, and also those tips about, you know, health and nutrition, folks. So 
you know, if you have to watch this video multiple times, I know you've taken a lot of notes, right? I want to thank you, Dr. Heather, for joining us here today on Coffee or Tea with Coach B, because I thought it was a great interview and you offered a lot of value. And hopefully you're not fully exhausted after that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not at all. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Brian. Like you right? truly are an inspiration to everyone. So, and it's uh, awesome what you're doing. So thanks for having me on. No problem. No problem. Okay, folks. Once again, it was good to see a coffee or tea with Coach B. And I will put Heather's uh, information, if she has any websites, in the link below that she wants you mm -hmm. to go check out her work or her research right? Uh, sure. There's a lot of good information that you get from her. She can change your life. <laughs> sure.